I've been speaking to you about the Ottoman Empire. I, I've given you this uh, narrative from Mark Mazower's book uh, on Salonika, uh, you know, when the, when the Nazis come there and they expect to find a Jewish ghetto, they don't find one, because I was trying to alert you to, of course, a number of things, which I'm not going to repeat now, uh, except uh, simply to say that, uh, that uh, you know, when we're thinking of the Ottoman Empire, and when we're thinking of empires in general, in general, uh, you have to think about one empire, many nationalities. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, for example, there, there were a dozen nationalities uh, absorbed within that single empire as well. So that's, that's essentially the story we're talking about. And, and uh, the other part of the narrative which I had commenced, which I want to take up now, it was, I mentioned to you that the decline of the Ottomans uh, dates back to certainly uh, the mid-19th century. Uh, and you, you have to look at the context of the Crimean War uh, over there, the, because even though Russia was uh, uh, handed down a defeat, uh, it, it, one of the reasons why uh, the, the French and the British uh, assisted the Ottomans was because they were interested in ensuring that there would be no Russian encroachment, since the Ottomans were now, as I said, at the point of decline. Right? And so what we saw in this slide uh, was uh, you know the losses uh, that that uh, are going to virtu eventually decimate the Ottoman Empire and and be what is eventually going to be a force modern day you know Turkey right uh, but there are some other contexts that we need to think about here as well this is just another uh, another map here which again is a different interpretation so if you look at the key over here a different interpretation uh, of the losses that we're really talking about what we want to do is we want to look briefly at the Arab world as a whole. Uh, uh, North Africa, uh, Egypt, and Sudan uh, come under British rule in 1882, uh, and uh, many of you may not be aware, because this is not ordinarily uh, uh, talked about even in the coverage that we had in recent years uh, when we had an uprising, uh, you know, what is called the Arab Spring, uh, in turmoil in, in Libya, in Egypt, uh, in Yemen, you know, a number of other places, uh, French North Africa, Morocco, uh, that uh, Tunisia, but that what is not uh, or ordinarily discussed in much of the background even to that is the fact that there was a vigorous uh, nationalist movement uh, in Egypt uh, from 1919 to early 1922, which would eventually lead to the independence of Egypt, although uh, the British uh, did not surrender um, uh, Sudan at, at that point in time. Uh, and as is the case uh, with uh, the Russian Revolution, the Petrograd Revolution, not the October Bolshevik Revolution, but the first revolution of 1917, women actually played a substantial role uh, in the Egyptian Revolution in 1919. So this is a, a photograph. This is from Cairo, uh, May 1919, uh, of uh, women uh, agitating uh, against colonial rule. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I want to remind you is that when we're looking, I mean, this is self-evident, of course, but when we're looking at the Ottomans now uh, and what's going to, uh, the decline of the empire and what's going to happen with the breakup and the creation of mandates, uh, that, that all of this is, the other context for this is, of course, World War I, right? Uh, that, that these histories that we're doing of the Ottoman Empire uh, and its decline uh, and uh, World War I to some extent are congruent histories. Uh, there are, of course, points of convergence, and there are, of course, uh, points of divergence as well. But this is, uh, and, and here's just another illustration here uh, of what I've been speaking about, about the role of women. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think it's particularly important to underscore this today because of the overwhelming impression that is sometimes conveyed in the press uh, that women there have been all this shackled, they've never had any degree of independence or autonomy. And of course, the struggle of women everywhere is a struggle for autonomy. But, uh, but that struggle is a struggle that you find in that part of the world. It's not just a struggle that took place uh, in the West. That's the point I really want to underscore you know, over here. All right, now, uh, uh, the, uh, in the midst of the war, um, we have to think about uh, a number of uh, developments, um, apart from what I've already mentioned about, about Egypt, okay? Uh, and these are the three major sort of, uh, if I may put it, put it this way, treaties or legal instruments, um, you know, that you have to think about or agreements that you have to think about that were created in the context of the war. 
because of course the question was that if the Ottoman if the Ottomans, the Turks, were going to be on the losing side, which they were of World War I, and we'll turn to World War I as a whole, of course, in just a few minutes, then the question was, well, what was going to happen to the, to the uh, uh, portion of the uh, Ottoman Empire which covered uh, what you might describe as the Arabian Peninsula and French North Africa, that, you know, that portion, all right? Uh, that was that was the question, and uh, and the the tale is a rather sordid tale of French and British intrigue. Uh, the the Arabs are going to be tempted by the British into staging a rebellion. There's a marvelous book which I read about 30 years ago uh, with Rashid Khalidi, actually uh, a book called uh, The Arab Awakening by George Antonius. It's sort of like almost read like a novel. It's basically a fast-paced narrative of what was uh, happening in that part of the world. Uh, and some of you might be familiar with this figure uh, known as Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, uh, his formal name, of course, is T.E. Lawrence. Uh, and I recommend very highly a book, if for no other reason than for the fact that he was one of the supreme stylists of the English language. And he wrote a, this book called The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, which is essentially an account uh, of his roles, which he magnifies to a great extent, of course. Uh, but what, what is happening there, uh, you know, with the holy places, um, Mecca and Medina, <coughs> and what is happening in Syria, Lebanon, you know, all of that, right? So the gist of the matter, as I'm suggesting to you, is um, that uh, the British and the French are going to be involved in various kinds of intrigues because the question was, well, what, how is this, how are the Arab, how is that portion of the world, the Arab world, how is it going to be parceled out? Uh, and so there's this correspondence, it's called the McMahon Hussein correspondence, which is, which is an exchange of letters uh, taking place between uh, July 1915th and January 1916 uh, between the Sharif of Mecca, so he's the custodian of the holy sites, okay? Uh, uh, Hussein bin Ali and Sir Henry McMahon, who is a British High Commissioner in Egypt. Um, and what, what, what is this correspondence about? The gist of it is that the United Kingdom agreed to honor Arab independence if the re Arabs revolted against the Ottomans. Remember, the Arabs are under Ottoman rule, right? So this is an agreement. So in, in short, that Britain is saying, you know, to the, Ar to the Arabs, we'll support your demand for independence provided you revolt against the Ottomans. Because of course, if there's internal revolt against the Ottomans, that's going to further weaken them, and this is going to obviously uh, enhance uh, prospects for a swift victory in World War One. World War One has broken out in 1914. Um, however, um, there is a secret treaty that is going to be signed on 16th May 1916. So this is just months after the correspondence, right? Just months after that. And this secret treaty is signed between Britain and France. And what do they do? They effectively decide between themselves that they are going to carve up the Ottoman Arab provinces between themselves. Right? Now, this, of course, completely contradicts the word that they had given to Hussein, which is the word that is embodied in the correspondence that, as I've said, is known as the McMahon. Hussein correspondent, because according to the Site Pequot Treaty, which is a secret treaty, by the way, and it's only leaked, I mean, word of it only comes to be known in, in late 1917, in November 1917, uh, in, in Russia, uh, and then subsequently in Europe, you know, days apart. Uh, what, what this agreement does, the Site Pequot Agreement does, is it basically, of course, negates the intentions that the British had expressed in the Hussein correspondence. And what is the, the moral of that story? One of the many morals of that story is people like the Arabs, uh, and because similar things I have to tell you happened in India, happened in countries that were under colonial sub subjection, uh, subjugation. And that moral was that you simply cannot rely upon European powers. Right? You cannot rely because there is no notion of adhering to an agreement. Right? There are various national interests, imperial interests, which are going to trump everything else. Right? And so, I, I, and again, I think all of this is important, including that portion about women, because this is still an area that you are reading about today, all the time. 
And if you're thinking to yourself, what is the nature of that turmoil? What are the roots of that turmoil? And let me be very clear. It's not that there's an axiomatic formula that whenever a place that was you know, under colonial subjugation, that if there's turmoil now, uh, then we, we can safely say that everything goes back to the colonial period. Right? But on the other hand, we cannot assume that this colonial history does not impinge on the present. It very much <coughs> impinges on the present. And if there is a profound mistrust in this part of the world, if there's a profound mistrust, for example, in China, to which we're going to turn in our next lecture, about the West, I think we're going to have to consider the legacy. For example, in the case of China, we're going to have to consider the legacy of broken treaties. We're going to have to consider the legacy of the Boxer Rebellion. Right? And we're going to have to consider the legacy of imperial interest and self-aggrandizement. Right? That is, I think, why this is important. All right. And then there is the Balfour Declaration, because of course, for all of you who keep up with the Middle East, even remotely, you know that apart from the whole question of what is happening in Iraq uh, and what is happening in Yemen, and, and then take, let's not even bring Iran into the picture, right? We, I don't even want to even remotely bring Iran into the picture right now, later on when we speak about decolonization in a, in a, in a bigger vein, I'm going to talk about that very briefly. Uh, but, uh, but if you think about the present conflicts, the overarching framework in the West is that, well, this all has to do with either something called Islamic terrorism or it has to do with the fact that in Islamic countries there are certain kinds of anxieties about modernity that have not been resolved. That is the template that has really been furnished to us about how we should interpret this. And then, of course, we have the conflict in Palestine, right? That, uh, so think about what, the, what, is the, what is the key document to emerge from that period, all right? It's called the Balfour Declaration. You know, nobody would have, nobody remembers Balfour except for this thing called the Balfour Declaration. I mean, he's, who was he? You know, he's a foreign secretary of the United Kingdom, so fairly high official, but would have gone into complete obscurity but for the fact that he issued a statement where he commits the United Kingdom to support demand for a Jewish national home in Palestine. Right? This Balfour Declaration is issued in 1917. You know? And now I, I, I think if you read, and, and of course, I mean, I, you know, I, mean, I mentioned the name of someone by the name of Rashid Khalili who teaches at Columbia University, uh, and I know that, of course, he's, he's viewed as a pro-Palestinian -Palest a Palestinian historian, uh, but I think I think that if you look at, for example, the contemporary scholarship, there's no question um, that he is certainly one of the more authoritative voices that we have in the present discourse. Now, if you read some of his works, a number of histories he's written about the Palestinian quest for a statehood. Okay, for example, a book called The Iron Cage. Now, one of the things that emerges from his work although this has been known widely for a long period of time, he's going to add some elements to the picture which, which we didn't know much about before, okay? So what, what is it that emerges? The portion that is familiar that emerges is that we know that there was Jewish migration into Palestine, okay? And this was, of course, done with the active encouragement of the British. All right, well, because what you're really talking about is a place that is overwhelmingly Arab. Uh, of course, there had always been this notion, and this is the rise of what is called Zionism. We're not really reading any of the documents, for example, people like Herzl and others uh, who uh, are the authors of the notion of Zionism. There are different kinds of Zionism. I can tell you very briefly that you can distinguish between what is called material Zionism uh, and something which is very often known as spiritual Zionism, all right? Um, and there are going to be a great number of Jewish philosophers. I mean, Martin Buber is an illustration of one of these philosophers who's going to weigh in on this question, too. But what is it that we really, that, that is important for, for your understanding of the dispute, okay? Uh, what is important is that there is going to be Jewish migration, it comes in different ways. So for example, Khalidi talks about the first 
wave of settlers and then the second and the difference is that that in the first wave of settlers the Zionists who come who basically take possession of the land you know this land is being sold to them there is an Ottoman there's an Ottoman land code uh, passed in the 1850s which is going to facilitate it the Ottoman state in some ways is actually going to be indifferent to what's happened that's part of the story uh, in, in, in Palestine but these first wave of settlers for example even when they took possession of the land, they would not necessarily dispossess the Arab peasants. In the second wave, this undoubtedly happened. This undoubtedly happened. Okay, and, I'm talk and now I'm talking about post-World War I, the second wave of Jewish settlers who are going to come into Palestine. So what's happening here? A concept I've used before. A certain kind of re-territorialization now you start bringing in Jewish people in. You try to change the composition. And of course, this is itself predicated on a fundamental idea that I have mentioned to you on a number of occasions. And this is a wonderful <laughs> illustration. The doctrine of terra nullis. The assumption either that there was no one there. You know, if you read an essay by Herzl, which I thought about as finding, it's 20 pages long, so dropped it eventually. But this essay he writes in the late 1890s, which is basically his plea for the Jewish state, when he writes about this part of the world, about Palestine, there is no mention of Arabs. It's as though they didn't exist. It's simply a question of what kind of Jewish state, well, what kind of Zionism are we talking about? You know, why is it that the Jews need a national state? The Arabs are just not to be found at all. Because assumption, either they are not there or this is empty land. It's unpossessed land. Or the variation that this land is not productive. So even Martin Buber, who is, I would say, a very thoughtful Jewish philosopher, in his exchange or in his uh, response which uh, that he issues to Mahatma Gandhi in 1930s, 1939, right? Uh, even even someone like him says, well, you know, the Arabs basically, they didn't really do much with the land. We, the Jewish people, rendered it fertile and productive. You know? And what Rashid Khalidi shows in some of his work, and that's a new element, really, frankly, comparatively speaking, is that there was, in fact, actually concerted resistance to the occupation of these lands. Uh, we're not talking about a story that started 10, 15 years ago. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about a story that started over a century ago. All right? That's important to remember. So when we're, looking at the, when we're looking at this part of the world, we think about the conflict in Palestine. We think about, OK, these agreements um, and uh, the movement in Egypt for independence. So I've given you three strands. And I want to turn to, of course, uh, the last important strand for our purposes here, uh, and that is what's going to happen to Syria. But before I do that, just very briefly, uh, there is no question that the, that, the, that the European imperial power that is going to be dominant in this region in many ways. Uh, you know, France is one, and then of course you have the second, which is Britain, and this map. I'm, 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 unfortunately, this key here is not very clear here, but. Uh, essentially what you're seeing is, so Syria, this is going to be French, we're going to look at that in just a moment. Uh, this is going to be a British uh, mandate over here, and this eventually is going to become, uh, you know, is going, portions of it are going to come under the rule of Ibn Saud, right? Uh, Britain had a substantial role in shaping this part of the world. That's the gist of this particular slide that we have here. What does post-World War II Middle East, 1923. Ottoman Empire is, carved, is basically you know, broken up, 1921, 22, 23. Uh, so you have a British mandate uh, of Palestine over here. Uh, you have the French mandate of Syria and Lebanon. And you have the British mandate of Mesopotamia or Iraq. Mesopotamia, by the way, is one of the two places in the world, uh, 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 the other being uh, North. West India, uh, but this is undivided India, where the British carried out extensive aerial campaigns, bombing villages from the air, bombing civilians from the air. This is the first time, frankly, that air power was used in history in this fashion. 
So that's why I mentioned it to you. Right? I mean, Nehru has a chapter on it, but there are entire histories that have been done about this. I've actually written about this as well because I've looked at the Indian context quite. And, and of course, these are the two oldest uh, spots of civilization in a way in the world that we're really talking about. Right? Uh, so it's worthwhile thinking about it. You know, you, you've got a modern European power which is basically uh, inflicting what George Orwell, in a classic essay called The Pacification, which he condemned, of course, you know, that when you bomb villages from the air, what is the word we use in English? Pacification, he said, with, of course, you know, savage irony, right? Because it's like, you know, when you pacify a baby, what do you do? You put a little nipple into its mouth to shut it up, you know? That's, it's the same word. You pacify them, which means, you know, when you create terrorism, among these villages and among the civilians, then you use the Latin, uh, derivative of the Latin word pax, peace, pacification, to describe what you're doing. There can be nothing more savage than this kind of use of language as well. We can terrorize with language as well, not just with bombs. Right? That's what George Orwell was trying to indicate uh, in his essay uh, when he talked about in uh, the politics of the English language. Uh, so when I said over here that they established these mandates, well, what are these mandates? The mandates come into existence uh, with the formation of the League of Nations. And you know the League of Nations, today it's, uh, I mean, hardly anyone even remembers it. The only time you ever read about it is in some obscure history books, uh, of course, for the most part, because it was a pre precursor to the United Nations. Uh, the League of Nations is established in 1920. Officially, it exists till 46, which means nothing, because of course World War II had already completely decimated the League of Nations. But the United Nations is a different attempt to resurrect uh, that past and to create a new world organization. The League of Nations created three, three kinds of mandates. We're not going to look at the whole history of mandates here. You know, class A, class B, class C mandates. Class A mandates were provinces of the Ottoman Empire. And under, under this, uh, the idea of a mandate was that you have to think of these places, which are going to be placed under a mandate, as places that under are in a state of tutelage. They are in a state of dependence. They are in a state of childhood, in a way. Right? It may be a more advanced state of childhood, uh, you know, and that's the distinction between class A, B, and C mandates, the degree to which they thought that these people were capable of some degree of autonomy, right? That's the gist of the matter. So they create a mandate in Palestine, which is going to be under the United Kingdom from 1923 to 48. Of course, it ends with the creation of the State of Israel. And you have a mandate created in Iraq. Uh, you know, if, you're wonder, if, you, if you ever wonder why there is so much hostility to Britain in that part of the world, you know, you, you again, I think you should think about all of this, you know. How did this system come into place? This, this condescending notion that there are people who are not equipped to rule themselves, uh, or in a state of childhood, so forth and so on. And the mandate of Syria and Lebanon, uh, which is going to be under France. And this goes back to the what? The sykes Peacock Agreement. That's what it goes back to. Remember that France and Britain really carve up the place. And I want to remind you, of course, I mean, we haven't gotten into World War I, we're just on the verge of getting into it, but World War I, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, right? <coughs> all these prophetic announcements, which is all talk, that's all it is, of course, about self-determination for the peoples of the world. And, and here you have secret treaties that are being signed by colonial powers and these places are being carved up. And of course, you have to ask yourself, well, how was this really different from what was happening in 1500 when Spain and Portugal, for those of you who might remember, we didn't talk about that because this is well before our time when we started this course, but Spain and Portugal received a papal bull, you might remember. And what was that papal bull? That all the unexplored territories around the world, particularly in the Americas, would be carved up between Spain and Portugal. That was a papal bull that was given in 1498. You know, right? so, the, so how is the world fundamentally different if you are a colonized person when you're looking at 1920? That's a question that 
I think should also animate your interest. All right. Now let's just look at Syria. So here we have Syria over here. Uh, so you have the state, you have Damascus, because as Nehru, you know, Nehru's reading is very old. I, I mentioned that to you, glimpses of world history, and remember, these are letters that he writes to his daughter, you know, from prison. Right? Uh, most of them written without any books, any sources, yeah, just from his memory, more or less. All right? And I think the picture he gives you is fundamentally correct. Now, of course, you know, he's not writing as a scholar. He's, he's not having footnotes. And of course, 100 years of scholarship after him has, you know, altered our understanding of some things. But fundamentally, he's not incorrect with respect to the partition of Syria. Because that's effectively what happened. So if you think about, for example, you know, who's the person who rules over Syria today? Right? You look at Assad, and, you know, who does he, what group does he represent? How did the Alawites come to power, for example? Right? Now, this, again, I think the history here is particularly useful. Right? So uh, it's really carved up into these five you know, areas over here, uh, these five areas. Uh, and um, no, I don't have a slide for that. But anyway, I can, I can tell you essentially what, what these areas were. So uh, in Damascus, of course, by the way, looking at the Syrian war today, right? Uh, the war in Syria today, this is, this, this is about the only place that is relatively secure uh, and has been relatively secure because this is, of course, where the capital is based, right? Um, and what was happening in Syria was that there was going to be a rebellion. There's going to be an attempt. Partially, it's provoked by the, the division and the split because why is, this, why is it that Syria is partitioned in this particular you know, fashion? Uh, over here. So if you look, for example, you know, the, if you look at this, the Alawite state over here, so this is a very small portion. Uh, these are Muslims, but they're Shias, okay? And, and in fact, uh, some Alawites are find, found in Turkey as well and in, and in Lebanon. Um, then you have, uh, then you have a greater Lebanon over here, so Beirut, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, the most well-known cities in some respects. In some respects, uh, uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, cities with uh, older histories, uh, Aleppo being, being uh, an illustration uh, of that. Uh, the majority of the population in Lebanon was Maronites, all right? Uh, and fr the French gave them a special status to win them, what? Win them over against Syrian Arabs, right? That's a classic policy. You take a group of people, you divide them. You know, you, you enhance the communal divisions, right? So you serve the Arabs against the Maronites, uh, the Alawites against the Maronites, so forth and so on. Right? This is a classic policy. And this is essentially what is going to explain this particular split that we're talking about, right? So what this is going to lead to is a kind of a nationalist movement in Syria that Nehru talks about a bit too. It's, it's not going to be until, if I remember it correctly, I think it was about 1942 or so when Syria achieved its independence, sometime in the 19, early 1940s, you know. Uh, but but, but it, is, it is the partitioning of Syria, setting off one group against another, creating the notion of minorities and majorities, which is, I want to add a little note here, which will be very useful when we turn to other parts of the world later on. This is a relatively modern way of thinking about groups of people, minorities. Because when we think of a minority, we think of people who are under stress, perhaps, whose rights have to be secured against something called a majority. But did people always think of themselves as forming part of a majority or forming part of a minority? This has very much a relationship to modern categories of thought, and it has a relationship, of course, to the fact that electoral democracy very much relies upon both banks, including both banks of groups called minorities. Right? This, this is all the context that you need to think about what is happening <coughs> in this part of the world. Right? So just to recapitulate, we're talking about we're talking about Syria being under a French, Syria, Lebanon under a French mandate, uh, a nationalist movement arising, attempts to defang this movement by partitioning Syria. 
Okay, we're talking about Egyptian independence movement, 1919-1922. Uh, we're talking about the mandates in other parts uh, of that world, including what happened in Iraq. All right, and we're talking about the origins of the Palestine conflict, going back to not just the Balfour Declaration, but going back to the late 1890s, right? with the articulation of the notion of Zionism uh, and then the encouragement of Jewish migration into uh, Palestine, which was very conveniently rendered as being a kind of a terra nullis. Right? That's really the gist of it. Right? However, what is the other big context? World War I. But before we get into the World War I, let us just pause for a second and reflect on the fact that we are now in the 20th century. We have been in it for just a bit. I was talking about the Russian Revolution, right? Because I think we should think about the 20th century first uh, in some larger terms uh, before we move into the context of World War I and the consequences and implications of World War I. So the fundamentally, I mean, the 20th century can be defined. Uh, of course, I mean, if you were in the United States, it, Many American historians have a pet answer about how you're going to define the 20th century, right? The American century. That's what it is, the American century. Right? Uh, and yes, that may very well be the case. I'm not going to, uh, I don't really necessarily have a quibble with that per se, but if we were to think about, well, what is it that makes 20th century existence different for most people? Right? So here are some considerations that the fundamental story of the 20th century is, of course, colonialism is at its height at this point in time, early 20th century, and now you begin to have nationalist movements. So I haven't added nationalism here because that is, it, that is already implicated in the notion of the nation state as we're going to see. Nationalism is going to become the potent force. And perhaps it may well be the story of this century as well. That remains to be seen. But certainly, if what's happening today uh, is any guide, then we have to say that, yes, nationalism will continue to be the story of this century as well. right? And so when I'm talking about nationalism, I'm talking about decolonization movements as well, anti-colonial movements. You also have the implosion of large empires. One of those empires is what we have looked at, the Ottoman Empire. Right? And that implosion started, as I said, in the 19th century, before, by the way, the Crimean War. I mean, I haven't talked about, for example, the Greek War of Independence, you know, right? Uh, because, you know, it really starts with, the, with areas in the Balkans which start to break away from the Ottomans. Uh, uh, and one of the great English romantic poets, uh, Byron, you know, was very much involved in this Greek War of Independence. So you've got this implosion of these large empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire, Austrian-Hungarian Empire, uh, and uh, if I may call it this way, the Japanese Empire. Because yes, I think that by the, by the, in the first half of the 20th century, the Japanese were uh, uh, fishing around for an empire, and they found one, or they created one. You know, right? Um, then you have the nation state as the apotheosis of history. So let's say, if, in a nutshell, if I said to you, OK, what is the big shift? The big shift is from empires to nation states. To nation states. A huge number of nation states that are going to begin to emerge. And in the Middle East, of Africa, in Africa, dozens, right? Nation states. And the, however, it is not simply a matter of, as it were, documentary record. The, no, the thing that you are called upon to reflect upon is, what is the meaning of the idea that the nation state is the apotheosis of history, the fulfillment of history, the fulfillment of human destiny? That our destiny of all of each one of us is to be a part of a nation state. And I think that this idea has hijacked the human imagination, unfortunately. You know. uh, and of course, this is one reason why you have these kinds of virulent and ugly forms of nationalism creeping up everywhere. You know, United States under Trump, very good illustration. Russia under Putin. Turkey under Erdogan. India under Modi. You know, so forth and so on. One can give numerous illustrations. 
But this is the idea. The nation state represents a kind of the fulfillment of, of history. But it is also the century of massive technological spurts. And, and this is in all domains. Military technology, certainly the atomic bomb, you know, the kinds of weapons and armory that one has is unthinkable, you know, even remotely uh, before this time. But one's also speaking about, of course, telecommunications uh, uh, and all the things that you are living with today. Right? Uh, did that the, the pace of acceler the, the rapid acceleration of technology. I mean, some people who are commentators about, uh, you know, public intellectuals who think widely about what's happening, not just people who are studying the, oh, history of the Civil War, you know, from 1861 to 62 in Gettysburg or whatever it is, or, you know, the history of the potato, you know, in Russia from 1849 to 1850, no, but, you know, people who are reflecting on larger questions. One of the, one of the arguments that has constantly cropped up in that kind of writing <coughs> is, is it the case that this technological advancement has far outpaced our advancement in moral thinking. Are we still thinking exactly as we were, for the most part, 50 years ago, 200 years ago? You know, right? But on the other hand, technology has outstripped everything else. And is that the nature of the dilemma in some ways? Right? <coughs> demographic explosion, massive demographic explosion, huge increase in world population. <coughs> Undivided India was 400 million, roughly, mid-1940s. India alone is 1.3 billion. If you add Pakistan, Bangladesh, because when I say undivided, then you have to include those two countries too, right? Then you're talking about 1.7 billion. 1.7 billion. And of course, what, what created this demographic explosion in part uh, was advancements. Uh, in medicine. Uh, and, and there again, have, let me add a little footnote very quickly. Uh, scientists and doctors, like many other people, I mean, this is perhaps a human tendency, they want to celebrate their own achievements. So there's this heroic narrative, heroic narrative about modern medicine, you know. Uh, I, can, I can point your attention to a whole strand of critical literature on cancer which discusses how huge a fraud possibly cancer research is, given the trillions of dollars that have gone into something called cancer research. Important thing, however, is this, that social historians of medicine agree and will tell you that most of the advancements had to do with simple developments in such things as sanitation, nutrition, Simple developments like that accounted for massive decreases in mortality. An understanding of what it means to have a clean source of water. Uh, you can resolve many of the world's diseases, not all of them, of course, by any stretch of the imagination, by simply assuring that everyone had a clean supply to clean water. A constant assured access to clean water would resolve half of the mortalities that you have today. I can guarantee that. If you just look at the literature. This story of demographic explosion then is not simply a story of, you know, as I said, these celebratory narratives about mm -hmm. modern medicine and surgery. You know, surgeons are like the rock stars, like neurosurgeons are the rock stars uh, uh, of modern medicine. It, it has to do with other developments. And then, lastly, 20th century contexts. For the overwhelming, massively overwhelming part of human history, the people have lived largely in rural areas, in urban areas. Sorry, in villages, in villages, rural areas. What you're talking about, something that, of course, begins in the late 18th century. Think of, of the Industrial Revolution. Right? And those contexts is you're talking about a gradual shift <coughs> towards urban areas and a shift in urban rural balance. It was in 2006 that for the first time in history, more than 50% of people lived in urban areas, in cities. For the first time 
in history. So this shift took place over a substantial period of time, but again, rapidly accelerated in the late 18th century and then moving to the 19th century in our own times. So what is the context for World War I? It'll just take two, three minutes to go through this because we've discussed all of this in passing already. Yeah. When, we've, uh, when I've, I've talked on numerous occasions about what I call the balance of power in Europe. And, and in World War I, do you have? What you have is you have what are called the Allied powers, uh, okay, also largely comprised of the Triple Entente, France, Britain, and Russia, versus the Central Powers, which included, of course, Germany and the Turks and the Austro-Hungarian, right, right? That's the balance, this, this is a long, part of a long history of the quest for balance of power in Europe. And as I've indicated to you, you know, this is really a European war, but there are going to be parts of the world that are going to be dragged in. They're going to be dragged in because you've got powers like France and Britain, which are colonial empires. So they're going to draw upon the resources of their colonies. Why is it a million Indians? A million Indians fight in this war when India itself is a subjugated country. Indians themselves do not have independence, but Britain can call upon India. And of course, there were processes of recruitment and so forth and so on, all right? So it's really a European war in that sense with implications, of course, for the rest of the world. And I'm saying the rest of the world or much, much of the rest of the world is drawn in on account of the fact that European powers are the dominant powers, right? So this is, of course, that wider context of imperialism, competition over resources and land, right? And this is what I've discussed with you vis-a-vis -vis Africa. When, when I'm talking about how, if you look between 1880 and 1913, there's a significant shift, right, in terms of what portions of Africa are colonized. That in 1880 it was relatively small, by 1913 it's much larger. Shifting alliances, this is all part of this whole story here again. So, for example, why is it that France is willing to ally itself um, with, with uh, uh, Russia, right? Why? Because of German militarism. German militarism. You know, there is, a, there is an awareness in France circa 1900 that you can no longer compete with Germany. Germany becomes unified 1872 under Bismarck. And so long as it was under Bismarck, the Germans really didn't harbor what you might describe as imperialist ambitions. But once Bismarck is dead, he's gone from the scene, the Germany is now going to try to move in wherever it can. There is not much left to occupy in the world, though. Now, you, you have to really think about that. And this is the context for World War II, because I'm going to lay it out for you right now, you, for you to think about this. Uh, you know, when people study the Holocaust uh, and what happened in Germany, World War II, very often it's divorced from the whole history of colonialism. It should not be not even remotely, because what Germany did in World War II was to inflict upon its own people, including the Jewish people, of course, what, it, what colonial powers had been doing to everyone else. It, what it really did was it brought colonialism squarely back into Europe itself. That's what it was in many ways. Now, the, this is what I mean, that there are these constant shifting alliances. It's, it's not that there's any matter of honor, you know, or this or that, that we're talking about. It's simply a matter of deciding, well, what interests are going to be best served by forging what kind of alliance? And this is one reason why France was willing to ally itself with Russia, you know, all right? Russia is on the winning side both in, of course, World War I and World War II. But I'm here, I'm talking about an alliance before, following another war that I haven't been able to talk about. Remember my caveat that if we started talking about wars and only wars, we just have a whole course on that, uh, the Franco-German Franco War of 1870. And this is what is going to impel the French to enter into an alliance with the Russians, because it was understood that you could not really contain Germany in any other way. Circa 1900. If you think about, all right, the three great, four great European powers, but three that we are interested in right now, 
Britain, the greatest naval power. Germany, by far the greatest land power in many ways. Right? And the buildup of the German military, you know, from Prussianism to Germany is, is that story in part. Right? And so we got and we've got Russia, which could not compete technologically but had manpower. Had manpower. <coughs> And which is going to be, again, an important factor both in World War I and World War II. So crumbling empires, I've mentioned, nationalist and revolutionary ferment in many of these countries. Uh, social ferment in countries, the rise of the working class, okay, demands for representation. All of these are factors. And when I say Germany and Lebensraum, Lebensraum I'm using it deliberately, almost anachronistically, because it's never used uh, in the context of World War I, it's used in the context of World War II. What is Lebensraum? The idea, the theory that Germany needed more space. It needs more breathing space. You know, Germany is not enough for the Germans. We need neighboring countries. We deserve them, right? So, so the occupation of Poland, which is, war, which is going to start off World War II, is part of the German ideology of Lebensraum. And of course, there was a racial and ideological content there, namely that, Germ that you know, Germany represents the true Aryan race, uh, the Aryans are deserving of more than others, so on and so on. And then you have these colonial wars. I'm gonna skip over that. I mentioned to you in, in, a, in a previous context, the Boer War, which is fought between the Dutch and the English. I had talked about that briefly. Uh, which is going to lead to the unification of South Africa in 1902, all right? The human toll of World War I. It, it, just look at the figures, right? 65 million people mobilized, eight and a half million dead soldiers, 21 million wounded, 37 million casualties, including civilians. Scale of this is enormous. It's going to be outstripped by World War II. Even though this was called the Great War, when you see, by the way, a reference in the literature to the Great War, they're not referring to World War II, they're referring to World War I, because it, it came to be called the Great War after that, uh, 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 with the anticipation that there wouldn't be uh, another Great Great War, uh, or if I may use Trump's word, bigly Great War, you know, <laughs> like, uh, that we had done with it, you know? But then who knew there would be a bigly War after that? Right? And this does not include civilians who are displaced, those rendered homeless, uh, uh, and the whole refugee crisis, because then you're talking about tens of billions of people already there, and casualties by country. I'm just gonna take two more minutes of your, two, three minutes of your time. Casualties by country. Uh, Russia, this is what I mean, manpower. You know, they have the manpower. Uh, uh, of course, Germany uh, is, suffers huge losses uh, as well. The United States way down there because as you know, United States didn't really enter the war until much, much later on, right? Uh, and, this is, and this is here again a very good illustration of the fact that this is a European war. Notice the person who made up this chart, okay, right? You leave out Japan, right? Where, where is India here? Look, it's not, you see this is how people write history. 56,000 Indians were, soldiers were killed. Why are they not here? Because frankly, well, who cares? They're like flies, you know? Drop them out. No, these are, this is not my chart. You know, I'm taking a chart that someone else has prepared. And then, of course, they'll tell you it is a, it is a world war. Well, if it's a world war, then let's hear about all the others as well. No, it is a European war. You know, I, I'm going to insist on that, that there is this whole problem that when Europe sneezes, the whole world sneezes. You know, it's the same thing with America. You know, when America mourns, well, the whole world should mourn, you know. Well, we should think about it, you know. This is the problem. The, the constant use of European, Europe-American experience, Euro-American experience, the Euro-American template to write everyone else's history, to determine their history, to tell us what they should or should not be thinking and doing. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stop here.
Um, because I need to spend time on this particular quote to get us into the whole ideology of sacrifice, blood sacrifice. Yeah, right? uh, but we'll stop here. Uh, we're about a lecture behind. Rob.